things we discussed in the lectures so far in the context of computer security. So? The main topic was hashes and what hash function is, how to use them. Uh -huh. Well, you refer specifically to the practical assignment. Yeah. What about the other classes? We spent an hour, and what are the side effects of that hour? We laughed a little bit, but do you have any notes? Go ahead. Yeah, I have some notes about threats in time frame. Mm -hmm. So we just cast some terms, which were, one of them is a threat. What else? And that was exploit vulnerability. Impact, risk, exploit, and vulnerability. Um, we also discussed about the objectives of computer security, yes. which were summarized as So you told me about confidentiality and integrity. What is availability? You want? Uh, yes. Availability is uh, the fact that uh, the data are available and, uh, in any moment of time or as much as you need it. Mm -hmm. Okay, and in your example you mentioned data, but this doesn't necessarily apply only to data. It could relate to a service or some feature. When I meant data, I meant uh, the data that the services might provide and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, could you give me examples of failures of fulfilling availability? Some famous historical example. Not necessarily you, but anyone else. For example, Berlin. When it happened? I think this was brought up last time. Something new. Well, I see you don't have that many examples. There was a bug on Facebook and you could not send messages. Mm -hmm. Well, when that happened, this country's economy went down. <laughs> um, any other examples? Maybe when that were doing updates, they are not available for a while and on the Okay, but that was planned downtime or but unplanned. It's still mm -hmm. Well, let's put it this way. If we have a bank, and in the bank there is a vault where you keep a lot of money and gold and information, of course. And there is a design requirement that says this door shall be locked between five and seven o'clock and nobody under any circumstances can get in. So someone wants to open the door at six o'clock and it's locked. Is this an availability problem or not? Because they wanted it to behave this way. So when you brought up the fact that Viber wasn't working when they were updating, maybe they wanted it not to work. Who knows? Um, what about integrity? Could you give me some 
notable examples of violation of integrity, not necessarily in the case of computers, it could be anything. When the bank is robbed, your money is gone, here you go, no integrity, put money, I suppose. Mm. Well, let's try to define integrity then. Maybe uh, I can give that an close. example. Uh, when uh, somebody uh, creates a fake passport or, mm -hmm. and uses it, so. or somebody uh, signs a paper that is not his or not that is not authentic, authentic. and it's fake. Mm -hmm. What about your example with logs? I was saying about the bucket logs and um, uh, maybe you got not the whole data, just a part and this part is not the one you need already. So uh, my idea is that you should have the whole information untouched, like as the sender sends to you, the server for example. To client. Mm -hmm. So when you say untouched, it means nothing was changed yes. in it. Mm -hmm. And what's wrong with something being changed? Uh, it's different than it can be already touched by somebody. Uh, it, can, it could be changed by somebody. So what's wrong with that? It's not, it's not, it's not that. Same. You are now doing what? Multicasting, broadcasting, or flooding. So you were first. Uh, it's not something you expect. So it means that mm -hmm. you using some services. And you expect one thing, and it gives a little bit changed things. So mm -hmm. basically, you the integrity of what you expect if it's not respected. All right. Uh, I could perhaps make an analogy by bringing up this. Thing from Russian culture that says, если в бочку меда добавить ложку дёгтя, получишь бочку дёгтя. Because the product was tampered with, and there is a, another variation of this where instead of дёгать, you add something else. But I can't say it, not on camera. <laughs> so you cannot trust that thing anymore. For example, you brought up logs. If we were looking at videotapes recorded during a robbery of a bank, but we know those video recordings came from an unverified source, we cannot guarantee that some parts of the recording were not taken out and some, or that something else was not placed in, etc. That the timestamps on the picture were not modified and so on or that the tapes are absolutely genuine but they were taken a year before on the same day at the same time and what about confidentiality So basically, it's about keeping a secret. Does this uh, mean the same thing that you had in mind? Um, not quite. It means that this data is not available to anyone else, just for me and for the person I intended. So two people are involved. You the time, and the peer. Are there any exceptions when there is just one person involved well, yes, or five you, people involved? Yes, maybe. When you intend to share your information or confidentiality with other people, why not? Mm -hmm. Share it with a thousand or a million people. Or you can save it only for you, like your public and your friends list in Facebook or contact list in yeah. Gmail or Twitter. Uh -huh. 
then my next question is, what is impact? Stefan, what is impact? I believe that impact is uh, when something happened mm -hmm. already. So when uh, a threat uh, became, uh, there is a consequence of a threat. So it becomes an impact. It's the next stage of the threat. Mm -hmm. um. Impact is the price you have to pay in case the data loses integrity or whatever the challenge. Mm -hmm. So when something bad happens, the damage you suffer is the impact. My I example is, is it only about damage? Impact is basically the consequences of the actions. So I don't know if a cracker got to your system and made a good update to your code and is it like the bad consequences of impact? No, there is mm -hmm. sometimes when, uh, for example, some uh, very uh, known person gets his account hacked and they get all the, their pictures and they're posted on the internet, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing because that person might get even more popular or mm -hmm. might, might get in the hype because somebody just posted their pictures, their personal pictures or whatever. Mm -hmm. Something that happened lately. Uh, could you give me an example of a high impact in history? or low impact. Or maybe you could invent a hypothetical scenario with a low impact. Yeah? Well, I think a high impact is where the, when Blizzard, Blizzard released StarCraft 2, it had a bug on a map. Mm -hmm. uh, it, doesn't, it didn't have, have a upper bound for frame rates. So? So uh, it was spinning up, uh, the, um, not spinning up, the, CPU? Uh, yeah, the GPU so so hard that it was starting to overheat. Mm -hmm. And eventually it, uh, it got a lot of people um, losing their uh, video card and burning it up. Poor people. So this is a bad impact of about. Okay, what about something worse than that? <laughs> and it worked um, because of the confidentiality of this um, they appeared some special web stores uh, yeah, and where you could buy or sell drugs and other stuff, guns and so on so this is an impact of the security or uh, the fact that you, you you buy it and then you lose it well, wait a second from the perspective of Bitcoin the fact that transactions are anonymous, it's a feature, it's not a bug. Yeah, it's, but for me, impact is not something bad, usually, always, or is it? Impact is generally what happens, like, Bitcoins gives you anonymously, to mm -hmm. be anonymous, so it gives some stuff for you, and this is the impact. The fact that you can do some other things with it. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, but Sergio, yeah. you were first. Uh, well, there were some hackers in the 60s, I guess, and they broke the slot machine algorithm at the casinos. Mm -hmm. So they found the algorithm that was generating random, random numbers, but not so random. It was just a list of random numbers. So if you get a number, you can know the second one. So they mm -hmm. used the device that you could basically guess what would be mm -hmm. the output. So they stole money from, let's say, stole money from the casino. So this is impact. So is this, is this high impact or low impact? Uh, guess high for the, for the owners of casinos. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't, I don't know actually how much they get, but mm -hmm. it's still an impact. Probably more than zero. There was a situation uh, I heard of in 
in uh, some uh, Iran or Iraq or whatever countries in, in Africa. Uh, the Middle East. Or whatever. I mean, Africa. Over there. Yeah. Well, or, uh, so the, the story was about a nuclear station that has had some really expensive uh, security system and it was all computerized and all that, uh, all automatic. And some hackers, I don't remember what country they were from, I think it was Russia or something. Mm -hmm. They hacked in and they uh, let the system spin up uh, the core mm -hmm. at such speeds that it just broke. It melted and broke and it, uh, it was a damage of, uh, yeah. It happened in Iran. Yeah. And this brings me to the next keyword, which we didn't bring up last time, but we will do today. And it's known as APT, and it stands for Advanced Persistent Threat. So before I explain what this is, I will ask you to tell me about threats. What is a threat? Is it good news or bad news? For whom is it bad news, etc.? Uh, wait, let's. Uh, Roman? Yes. Uh, Pietro Negre. Okay, well, uh, what is a threat? A, a possible action or a situation from the outside that could possibly damage your system or could damage you. Mm -hmm. Can you give me a real example of a threat? A nuclear threat, I think, maybe. Mm -hmm. It makes sense. Um, and what's the difference between a threat and a risk? Uh, Alexandro. Well, not exactly in those terms, but you are, some of the things you said made sense. Um, so if you take the threat and you multiply it with the likelihood of this threat actually exploiting one of your vulnerabilities, you get risk. So for example, last time we discussed about sharks and humans. If you live, so sharks are a threat to any human being because we don't have armor and we don't have stronger teeth than they do and we can't swim as fast as they can. But if you live in Moldova, the risk of being attacked by a shark is zero because we don't have sharks around. But if you live in Australia, then the threat can materialize so the risk is non nil. If you live in Australia and you swim in the surrounding waters, I mean, you could be somewhere in inland Australia and then it wouldn't be a big deal. So let's go back to this advanced persistent threat. Um, each of those words are clear. Advanced means that it's highly equipped well-funded, very well-motivated, and they have access to a wide range of resources that they can use to kick your ass. For example, they might have a team of physicists, you know, because they might tell them how fast those centrifuges have to spin in order to be broken or you know, some people who are very, very skilled at mechanics and mathematics, etc. Um, I mentioned that they have a lot of funds. So they can afford really expensive toys 
gadgets, satellite observations, bribes, lobbying. These are resources that you can leverage to get things done. So they also have technology and they have a lot of intelligence too. So this is not just some random person on the internet running a script. Script kitty is the term for these people who have no understanding of how something works, but they looked it up on Chumham. They uh, downloaded a tool, they filled in an IP address, they pressed the attack button, and somewhere on the other side of the building, a computer turned off. Uh, these guys are advanced, so they know how this works. They invent such tools when it's necessary. Uh, another thing, persistent, means that this threat persists over time. Usually, this relates to the fact that the target is very well protected. So whoever owns the target or uses it or is the target dedicates a lot of resources to make sure that nothing bad will happen to it. So when I say persistent, it implies that whoever wants to attack this target is really, really, really motivated to do this. And they are committed to such an extent that they are ready to do this uh, for many years. They can sit quietly and wait until a specific event happens. Uh, in the meantime, they can spread their network of agents, double agents, spies, bribes, bribists, bribers, uh, whatever. So they will keep an eye on you and be there when you are in the moment of weakness. Um, moreover, it usually implies that such a, an APT will not stop at one thing. They can persist over time because they have to continue exerting an influence on your systems. But in this example, um, it is hypothesized that the target was this uh, nuclear facility in Iran. And as soon as the mission was complete, they vanished in order not to leave any traces about who they are, how they did it, when they did it, why they did it, etc. Um, who do you think the APTs are? Is it a person? Is it two people? Uh, security service. National security services. Mm -hmm. So it could be a nation, like a government or a state. Who else? A terrorist organization. <coughs> And you brought up ISIS, which I think is a good example, because it doesn't have to be an organization registered at the Camera de Commerce, whatever. They don't necessarily have to have a website where they publicly state their mission and objectives. Who else? Ah. Uh, maybe just a company, I don't know, in order to make their... Organization. Yeah, but I mean like organization, we spoke about terrorist organization, but let's talk about like public organization like Facebook, I don't know, let's say, mm -hmm. hypothetically, they try to threaten, let's say, contact you. And 
Uh -huh. So in this example, uh, we use, well, in this case, it's about competition in the market. Yeah, competition. Mm -hmm. Well, I could say that Facebook would have the resources to be advanced, though, um, and you know, they have the funds, they have the technology, they can hire all the people they want. However, I wouldn't file Facebook under the category of APT. Uh, normally this term applies to, hmm. as we discussed, you know, governments, groups that want to cause damage at the physical layer, like killing people, destroying cities, uh, damaging power plants, etc. So I wouldn't say Facebook fits this description unless it comes to light that they had done something in the past or that they are currently working on something. Hmm. You have something to add? Yes, I think Facebook is really dangerous because it's attacks the people on the physical layer with Sugar Saga and other brainwashing games. So Sugar Saga? <laughs> I must have missed some episodes. What happened? What is it? It's a, I don't know, I never played, but it's a game which you gain points. I don't know what you do there. But mm -hmm. so, uh, I'm not annoying, but uh, what you started. Mm -hmm. but Time affects, consuming. Yeah, it affects a lot of people, and they are like zombies running over there. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we should add another. Um, sub point here. These actors are usually not interested in money. So whatever Facebook does is to maximize profit. Those do this because of ideology, because they have to protect their lives or they want to wipe off somebody else off the face of the planet, etc. So that's why I don't feel like Facebook belongs to a list of examples of what's an advanced persistent threat. Another thing about them is that they dedicate a lot of effort to remaining undetected and concealing their methods. So it has to be a, as stealth as it could be. For example, uh, in the case of Stuxnet, they relied among other things, on so-called zero-day vulnerabilities or zero-day exploits, or just zero-day. Um, so do you know what this means? So let me explain. Uh, there is a vulnerability, a term you already know, and there is a piece of software or a system that we use on a daily basis. For example, it's a web browser, an email client, or a bank program that we use to transfer funds. Some people play with it, disassemble it, look at it from different angles, and they realize that, hey, if I send a request that is exactly that many bytes long and it has a null byte in the middle, this thing crashes. So they have discovered a vulnerability. Then, from this point on, several things can happen. They can go to a mailing list like Sekunia, where they make an announcement that I found such a vulnerability, this is how you can exploit it. They can contact the company who owns the software to tell them that we have discovered this vulnerability, this is how it works, we give you 60 days to patch it, and then we go public with it. But what they can also do is they can keep it to themselves. So nobody knows about it. And there is a market of such vulnerabilities that are not known to anyone, such that you could exploit them in case you want to get something done. Now here's what happens. Let's say you discovered a vulnerability in a browser that enables you to redirect a person's request to a given URL. 
So you found this vulnerability, you wrote an exploit, and you begin redirecting people to a website, which sets up, uh, I don't know, a key logger, for example. Now, if you do that, at some point, people will begin to notice that, hey, my password got stolen, I didn't give it to anyone, I only used this computer, how could it happen? So they begin to look around, and they realize uh, that this happened via a keylogger. Somebody else observed that the same thing happened on their computer, so the community begins to investigate. So that's how they understand what happened. And this vulnerability is being discovered. When a vulnerability is discovered, somebody, well, the author of the software can patch it, send updates to everybody, so now the whole world is protected. Uh, this has several side effects. So if I discover a vulnerability and I begin to use it, the community becomes aware of it and they devise a method to protect themselves. But if I discover it and don't use it and keep it to myself, then I can sell it to someone for really big money or I can use it when I need it for a very specific purpose. Now, I could use it for something as simple as stealing my colleagues' passwords or changing the grades in my matricula at uh, Dekanat. You know, it's a very small crime, not a big deal. Or I can use it just one single time to break some uh, centrifuges in the Middle East. And then I don't care if anyone discovers how they did it. The point is that I could use this method on the day that I wanted to use it. And I was certain that nobody else knows about it. So zero day means that it's fresh in the sense that nobody knows about it, nobody knows how to deal with it yet. So there is a market of such things. It's not something you can buy at Piazza Centrale, of course, but there are websites where you can reveal the fact that you are selling zero-day exploits without explaining what the method is. And this is a really huge market that yields a lot of money. Uh, why did I mention that? What was the thread before we got to zero-day? Stuxnet, okay. So uh, this was a really, really complex mission, which is a series of events that have to happen in a specific sequence. And sometimes there is a window in time when it has to happen. If you don't make it within this interval, the next window of opportunity will be either never or two years later. Or you know, not at the right time. So that's why it has to be carefully orchestrated. And that's what an advanced persistent threat can do. It has been speculated that this is the result of work of uh, Israeli -in intelligence services because Iran officials have made public statements about how they hate the guts of Israel and the Israeli people and how they will try their best to make sure they vanish. Um, so it's something we could speculate about. But the thing is that to this day, there is no official investigation that would give us clear answers about who did it and what their motivation was. And the, con the context was that an advanced persistent threat will go to great lengths to try their best to stay undetected, even after they have completed their mission. Because all those tricks they used to make it happen could be used on another time in another context. So the less you talk about it, the, the better off you are, the greater is the probability that you will indeed succeed. Um, we could do something 
uh, in this class, uh, we could nominate one person who will read and do some research about Stuxnet on tomorrow, give us a short overview of what the consequences were and what the current best guesses are about who did it and how they did it. Are there any volunteers? Not yet. But I'll try to sweeten the deal by uh, know, giving you bonus points for an assignment if this is done. Um, and when I say remain undetected, I don't talk about the methods that were used or the organization behind it, but also about the fact that something is going on. For example, let's say you have a computer. And our mission, hypothetically, is to make sure that eventually, at some point, the computer in the dean's office gets infected with something such that we get access to the database where your grades are kept. And the ultimate objective is to change the grades so somebody can pass without attending classes. And let's say that the target is located here. Uh, we could, and there's a, the target is some program running on the computer. We could try to set up some program on this computer directly, but if we don't have access to it, we can try a number of tricks to make it happen. What are those tricks, in your opinion? You could try to infect any other computer that, that's in the same network, for example. Okay, so if we know that this thing is in a network with other systems, we could infect one of them and then hope that eventually the thing will get to the target. What else? What about the people who use this? <coughs> Can we do something about them? You can physically pass some virus on a USB flash. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, the person that uses that computer. Uh -huh. So if there is a person who uses this system, we can try to influence the person rather than the system and then let the person do the dirty work for us, even without being aware of it. What else can we do? Using social engineering. Social engineering. Uh, we'll talk about that in depth at a later point in time. So social engineering is the art of manipulating a person to do what you want them to do. Uh, what else? We can redirect as a uh, other person mm -hmm. to, uh, to, to our computer by programs like uh, like like kind. Kane. Like Kane. Uh -huh. We can redirect to our computer, and our computer will uh, make something for this amount of change. You refer to ARP spoofing? Yes. Mm -hmm. oh. What else? We were talking about the master system threat. Uh -huh. uh, we could infect the system before it gets to the place where it's going to be. Because we're advanced. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, we could sabotage the company that sells them, that sells hard drives to the university and have something pre-installed. We could sabotage the people who sell them windows. We can give them an installation CD which has some embedded uh, features that they didn't know about. Um, and the point is, let's just say that we do this by, so this is the secretary that works in the same office as this system is located. And we, at first, set up something on this secretary's computer. 
it could be a backdoor which we installed by sending the secretary a screen, a free screensaver with dancing uh, Santa or something like that. So this thing, when she clicked the screensaver, it installed a piece of malware. This thing stays undetected on the machine. And when I say undetected, I mean that even though it gives us full control over what happens there, we can get her bank password, we can get her email password, we can go onto her Adnaklasniki account, we can buy things from Amazon and pay with her card, we can do anything we want. But we will not do that because our objective is that system. So when I say we remain undetected, I also mean that even though we have the power to do a lot of things, we will not activate this mechanism until we know that it's in the right place at the right time. And we can do that by perhaps keeping an eye on the IP addresses that the machine is assigned. We know that if the IP address is blah, 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 it is an address that belongs to this network. And then we can also use other criteria to confirm that. For example, we know that in this network there are several machines. One of them is called Venus. The other one is called uh, Jupiter. And this one is called Titan. So this piece of malware has some logic inside that keeps an eye on the IP address. And then it runs a bunch of, uh, it tries to resolve this, this, and that name to an IP address. And if this name could have been could be resolved to an IP address, then we have reasonable, uh, we have reasons to say, yeah, we are physically in this network. So now we can trigger the malware and let it do the next step in this grand scheme of things. So uh, I hope I explained what an advanced persistent threat is and you have some picture of what is such a threat and what isn't. I must admit that this example with the university is probably too silly. Um, because an advanced persistent threat is usually a government or a large organization with piles of money. It's not a student who wants to, to change their grades. But you know, at least in general, you have the idea. Now, since we discussed this, I can introduce another keyword, which is that of an attack vector. Uh, we already, well, you came up with several attack vectors. One of them was um, social engineering, a person who uses the system. The other one was social engineering, a person who works in the same place as the target is located. Uh, somebody mentioned a USB drive on which we can pre-install some stuff. So <coughs> these things are attack vectors. If this is a target, we can try to approach it from multiple points. So this direction, this direction, this one, this one, this one. All of them are attack vectors. And if you want to secure a system, you have to make a long list of possible attack vectors and try to combine them in different ways so you know what to pay attention to and how to properly defend the system. The next thing I have to introduce is the concept of an attack tree. An attack tree is a visualization of all of the attack vectors with all the branches that you have to follow in case an attack vector fails or succeeds. Let's take into account a simple example. Uh, we have 
a computer connected to the internet with a CD-ROM floppy disk drive with four USB ports a keyboard a mouse What else do computers usually have? Okay. I think this is Firewire, the standard that defines it. So there is also a monitor. What else? Well, let's just leave it at that. Mm -hmm. External hard drive connected to an eSATA interface. This thing runs Windows Vista, a 64-bit version of Windows Vista. And in this system, there is a file that we want to access. It's a recipe for making cookies. It's a secret recipe for making cookies. So, given this information, how can we get access to that file? What's the easiest method? What's the next easiest method? And so on. Yeah. Okay. So, normally, you start with the easiest method, just like you described. So, if the computer is on, and if it's unlocked, then you just copy the file. If it's not unlocked, what do you do? Guess typical passwords. If it worked, you copy the file. If it didn't work, what's your next step? Use social engineering to retrieve the password. What else? So you could try to boot force the password. Mm -hmm. What else? Is another user. So if it's not unlocked, uh, this didn't work, log on as another user. What else?
Come on. Do you want that cookie recipe or? Aha. Uh -huh. So if the machine, it doesn't matter if it's on or off. What matters is, do we have physical access to the machine? So if we have physical access, we can do that. Um, we could get the HDD out. Well, what normally happens is I should make this uh, branch, I should title it, do I have access to the computer case? Because some systems, like a bank ATM, is embedded inside a wall and it's in a big metal box you cannot open, so it has physical protection. But it would take a lot of space, so let's just summarize it like that. Do I have physical access? Can I unscrew the, the cover of the case to get the hard drive out? And if yes, I can do several things. I can uh, take this, mount it to another computer, and copy the files and put it back and cover all my tracks as if nothing happened. Or I can just steal it. Way and yeah. Um, what if I have physical access, but the case is soldered? You know, it's hardwired. You cannot get it up. What else could I do? Like a Mac. Huh? Like a Mac. Well, you could use a screwdriver, right? Or they are. Uh, uh huh. Wow. Hmm. Well, let me add another detail. Um, in Windows Vista, they added a new feature called BitLocker, which encrypts the data on the partition. And if we get the system, if we do have physical access to the system, but it's off, then even if we get the hard drive out, all the info is encrypted. So it's not very useful to us because it would mean we would have to break that encryption. It would be ideal if we had access to the machine while it's unlocked, the hard drive is decrypted and mounted so we can access the file system like, any, like on a normal day. Which branches would, then we, ha would we then have to follow? Well, there are many ways to get this done. So this is an exercise. Try your best to invent a method. Creativity has no limits. Um, Alexei. Yeah. The machine is locked, but it's on. What do you do? Yeah, we already tried that. And there is a human next to this computer. Uh huh. So, somewhere at the bottom of all of these branches, when everything fails, we can use a gun. You kind of persuade a person with a gun? Well, a gun is the last trick in the book of social engineering. <laughs> um, 
it's not social engineering anymore. It's use of kinetic energy to persuade people to get <laughs> things done. <laughs> um, so you had another idea. Um, we could uh, spy on the person that uses the computer, put in the camera that... Uh, okay, so... Uh, when he types the password. So there is this thing called shoulder surfing. I think that's the term. You could use higher tech, like uh, uh, find the fingerprints or the way you explained with the body heat when mm -hmm. we use our thermal scanner. So, so we could observe the person using the system. Maybe um, we can watch them type the password. They are a very slow typist. That would work. Maybe there is a video camera in the room where they type, and this is an HD camera to which we happen to have access. And we can just watch the video recordings and get the answer. Maybe the person keeps the password on a sticky note <coughs> under the table or under the monitor. Laxative or a sleeping pill? Yeah. <laughs> or you can knock him out. <laughs> or you could do something like this. You accidentally spill a cup of coffee and say, oh my god, I made such a mess. And of course, it's, imagine that I'm a very pretty girl and I do this. And the person is a very helpful male who wants to help me. So uh, he goes to the next room uh, to get some, I don't know, rags or clothes that they can use to wipe it. And while he's doing it, I say, oh, I've, I have to pay my bill, otherwise I will get my power disconnected. Can I use your computer? And he says, well, of course. <laughs> so that would be an example of social engineering. Well, there are many ways you could apply social engineering, but none of you have um, used the USB ports. How can we exploit that? In which way? Well. So the first point is to get them to connect a USB stick to our target machine. And uh, so we, we connect a flash drive. And if auto run is enabled, which is the super feature where a predefined program is started automatically when a drive is plugged in, and it used to be enabled by default in the past, but not any longer. But if it's enabled, then this thing does what it does in the background. It sets up a key logger, or it looks for this file in my documents or by a pattern in the file's name. And it begins sending whatever it can find by email or uploading to an FTP server. Or it writes it back to the flash drive in a predefined directory, so when I take it out and walk away, I have it. Uh, this could work if, for example, I am asking this person to print a file for me. And this could be a PDF, and the PDF could be crafted in such a way that when you open it with Adobe Reader, 
some code is being executed and this code gives me admin rights so I can then do stuff. Um, what about the CD-ROM? How can it be used in this potential attack? Mm -hmm. Okay, so if I have a friend who works in the repair company, I know that's the place where they will give the computer when something breaks. So we give them a malformed compact disk, which will blow up in the drive, and they will say, oh no, give this machine to the repair service, and I have a friend there who will give me the file. Well, the point is that all the things that we have discussed so far, if you represent them as branches, you eventually build an attack tree. And the more complete your attack tree, the greater is the chance that you will indeed succeed in getting this uh, secret recipe for baking cookies. You could say that attack trees are used by bad guys to make a plan on how to attack a target. But this is also an exercise for the good guys who have to protect the system. Because when you have to defend something, you have to anticipate the actions of an enemy. So you need to think like an enemy in order to figure out how to best protect yourself. That's why it is really important to, to play with such exercises every now and then in order to make sure that all the possible ways through which you can be attacked are taken into account. Yeah? Isn't this method called penetration testing where you, have, you employ some persons to try to hack your system intentionally and to reveal some vulnerabilities in your system? Mm -hmm. So... Uh, your colleague brought up the term penetration testing, also known as pen testing, uh, which typically is about the following. You are some security expert hired by a company to tell them if they are vulnerable. You have permission from the company management to try whatever tricks you want. And whenever you find some attack vectors which were successful, let's say this branch yielded the desired result, you are morally and contractually obliged to, to tell them that this happened, this is how I did it. So you basically tested whether they work, I mean whether this, uh, the secure perimeter in this company could have been breached. So Building attack trees is something that a penetration tester does because you need to make a plan in order to, to know how to proceed. Without a plan, you just you know, try things at random, but that's not as effective because when you build a plan, you think about it, you realize that, hey, there's one more thing I could do there, another thing I could do here. Does this address your question? Um, so the more complete the attack tree, the better prepared you, the more prepared you are. Uh, last time, oh, we have free space there. We did not manage to discuss the question, what makes computerized attacks more dangerous than non-computerized ones? There are several such things. What are they? Think about it and generate some ideas. Why does computer attacks are more dangerous? Yeah, what makes computerized attacks more dangerous, more effective, cheaper than other types of attacks? Because it can be 
automated. Okay, so automation is one thing that makes a big difference. Maybe related to our identification, you could delete an existence of a person if you want, like from the data in the informatical world. Like mm -hmm. Have you read the book 1984 by George Orwell? It's about a totalitarian regime which could manipulate the masses using propaganda machines optimized for that. And they had a, a special term which is unperson. And when the authorities would say, let's unperson Alexander. Uh, everybody in the libraries, in the archives, would look for all the books, articles that had references to Alexander and wipe them off or replace that name with something else. So that's what the term unperson is for and where it comes from. Uh, and also the term big brother comes from the same book. But in this case, uh, you can do that even without a computer. Like you went to the library, you deleted all occurrences of a given name, and computers don't make it any worse, but you can automate it and do it faster. What else? Maybe connectivity that all the stuff today is connected to the network. Uh, mm -hmm. So computers, machines, always computerized, and you can access Theoretically, you can access everything from your computer. Mm -hmm. Well, I will express that in slightly different terms, which is remote action. Remote action implies that you can act at a distance. Because everything is interconnected, I can press a button here and have a side effect pop up on the other side of the planet in a few seconds. What else? Well, we are in the age of information, so people talk like via mail or social networks, and this information sometimes can lead to very big consequences, like, in world, like politicians, and it leads to war or power start between different nations. Mm -hmm. so, uh, have you heard about the Watergate hotel scandal? Uh, this happened in the U.S. some decades ago where there were leaks of some recordings by a presidential candidate compromising themselves in one way or another. So information leaked without computers. It happened with good old-fashioned methods like tape recorders or phone taps. So computers can make things worse because now you can remotely uh, leak information or you can automate the process of collecting data and then leaking it. But information leaks as a phenomenon exist way longer than computers. So this does computerized attacks unique. What else? Nico. I think it doesn't take much resources like, like uh, physical stuff. Uh -huh. Just cheap. So you could say that it's cheap? Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you think I can come up with an example of a non computerized attack that is cheap? For example, a denial of service attack. Uh, that would prevent an ATM from giving money to people. I just pick up a hammer, I break the screen, and I run away. <coughs> it's very cheap. I can even pick up a rock. I don't need a hammer. So computers make certain things cheaper, but even without computers, there were ways of cheaply getting things done. 
So another thing would be like it's more safe to attack a computer or something than to attack like physical or something. Well, it's remote action. I can remotely attack somebody. We can reuse it? Reuse it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It makes sense, but so is the case with the real world outside of computers. I explained how to break an ATM. Now all of you can use the same rock and create denial of service attacks against ATMs in this city. But this sounds close. So let me add another ingredient, which is technique propagation. And it was written somewhere here, script kitties. The problem is that it takes one researcher to think and program an exploit or a hacking tool. It could require a lot of intelligence, time, resources, but once I'm done, I can publish the exploit online and then anyone can use it. So the problem is that in the case of, uh, let's say, that I am a car thief. I know how to unlock a car using a paper clip, for instance. And I spent hours and hours of practices and failures, reading books, examining different locks, you know, collecting experience and prokachovat uh, persa, as they say. So it took me a lot of time to achieve this level of skill, and then I can replicate this on any car I want. But if somebody else wants to do the same, they have to invest in their education too. They have to watch me, they have to read the same books, they have to ask me questions. So it's not something that you can just pick up like a script and double click and give it an IP address as a command line argument and, and crash a remote machine. So technique propagation increases the, the potential area that can be damaged. Because once a technique is out there, anyone can reapply it. And when you combine it with this and that, you get something which is a much bigger problem than a guy hitting ATMs with a rock. You had a comment? Person by cameras, by mm -hmm. uh, have you heard about Jack the Ripper? Yeah. Yeah. A serial killer killed a lot of people in London a lot of time ago. To this day, nobody really knows who this person was, and they did this without a computer. So if you want to stay anonymous, Computers might help, but they don't give you a great advantage over somebody doing this in, in an offline setting. Do you agree? Well, perhaps you could try to convince me otherwise. Is it time for a break? Okay, then let's have a break.